Welcome, everyone. This is the Top Professionals event tonight, including students of dentistry, elite dentists, top dental practices, and Vol Pre-Dental Club at Pitt. And today we have our featured guest, Dr. Rolf, oral and maxillofacial pathologist. We've done work in the past together. We made some reels on Instagram, some TikToks on minor salivary gland carcinomas, some pathology there. We got the expert going on. Um, by the way, I'm looking forward. I'm really looking forward to a couple more videos coming out of you. you we got to get ready for that. Defining a diagnosis. Take it away, Dr. Roth. I'm super excited for this today. All right. Thank you. Oh, that's a that's a big introduction to live up to. But uh, like Brendan said, my name is Stephen Roth. I am a oral and maxillofacial pathologist out of New York. This is my Instagram and YouTube accounts. And just wanted to briefly introduce myself. Uh, I did undergrad at The Ohio State University and did my four years of dentistry there as well. You can see me with Brutus Buckeye in my, my cap and gown. I then uh, moved to the East Coast from the Midwest and did my residency at Northwell Health Long Island Jewish Medical Center, um, which has been featured in several movies. It's, it's a very beautiful hospital and ended up getting hired there as an attending oral and maxillofacial pathologist. And then I also am an adjunct instructor at Toro Dental Health, which is in Westchester, north of New York City. And I'm also, uh, I cover the clinic in the evenings uh, twice a week at a dental hygiene school in Queens. So I currently practice right here, you can see in the map, just right outside of the borough of Queens and very close by to the five boroughs of New York City and the suburbs of Nassau County and Suffolk County. So first, because this might be a little bit of a, a mixed audience, I know that we might have some dental students, maybe some pre-dents, as well as some practicing dentists, or even people outside of, of dentistry. Uh, and I just wanted to briefly introduce the specialty, which is oral and maxillofacial pathology. It's an extremely small specialty of dentistry. There are only about 250 to 300 practicing in the entire United States. Most of us are in dental schools, but some like myself are in hospitals and a handful are in private practices. And the purpose of the specialty is to diagnose conditions of the oral cavity in patients and under the microscope. And this is outside of what we normally think of when we think of dentistry, which is cavities and gingivitis. It's more along the lines of cancer, autoimmune diseases, infections and allergies and all of those exciting things. So in the profession, there are kind of three different areas that we kind of dip our toes into. Uh, the fourth is research. And if an oral pathologist is involved in research, that's typically where they spend most of their time and attention. But the rest of us kind of split between teaching, microscopy, and patient care. And because I'm in a hospital, I'm kind of where that dot is. I'm kind of between patient care and microscopy with a little bit of teaching through my YouTube channel and through my other gigs. Tonight's brief presentation was on the concept of diagnosis and what that means and why it's important. So first I wanted to go over what a differential diagnosis is, which is essentially a list of possibilities organized in most likely to least likely based on the appearance, the epi epidemiologic data, so what is most likely to occur, and then experience. A phrase that we like to use in the profession is if you hear hoof prints in the night, think horses, not zebras. And that's just a very fancy way of saying you don't want to jump to the most rare and interesting diagnosis first. You want to think about what is most common based on the presentation and based on epidemiologic data. And then you can include the rare things. The only thing is that zebras do exist and they don't just exist in zoos. So uh, another phrase that I like to use is it's not rare until it's in your chair. Uh, so you, you want to make sure that you have these rare things in the back of your mind. And I picked a few cases to highlight this concept. The one thing I do want to fully admit is that this is selection bias. So that means I've obviously picked out some of the crazy cases that I've come across but these are real patients, real cases that I've seen in my practice, and real possibilities that exist when you see patients that present the way that these do. 
First, uh, you start with a clinical diagnosis, and that's based purely on what you see in the mouth before you ever think about doing a biopsy or looking at material under the microscope. And there are some conditions that can be diagnosed exclusively on clinical exam alone. And I've included two of those here. Uh, this picture is one of my patients with geographic tongue, which no more needs to be done. That's, that is geographic tongue. And then this is something I pulled off of Google that is a linea alba, which again is uh, something that we know just by looking at it. No, no further workup is, re is required for that. But a lot of times something does require confirmation under the microscope. And that's when you come up with a differential diagnosis where you come up with a list of possibilities and then you submit it for examination. So this is my, my first of two case sets and they're all essentially bumps and swellings of the lip. And the things that you wanna think about in this scenario are mucoceles, which are the rupture of the ducts of salivary glands where you get spit essentially pooling into the oral cavity under the tissue. And then fibroma, which is the second most common. And so these entities ended up being these different things. So this, uh, First one on the left is a mucosil. That is a very, very large mucosil. This is a six-year-old kid, bit his lip, broke the duct of the minor salivary gland, which led to saliv saliva getting into the tissues. This in the upper lip is actually sister psychosis, which is a tapeworm. So in this patient, uh, we as humans in the developed world, we usually get tapeworms from undercooked meat where the tapeworm larvae are living inside of pork and other meat products. And then when we consume it, we get the adult form in our intestines. In this case, the patient drank contaminated water and became the pig. So the tapeworm larvae uh, found a, a new home in the muscle of the upper lip. If you're interested in this case, I do have a full case presentation of this patient on my YouTube channel. So I won't go too far into depth, but it's, it's one of my favorite cases, uh, a tapeworm in the upper lip. And then this is a case that came through about two weeks ago from a local uh, clinician, very, very small bump on the lips. It looks very much like a fibroma, but under the microscope, we saw all of these little tiny blue dots. And this ended up being rhabdomyosarcoma, which is a cancer of um, skeletal muscle cells. And it's not too common, but it does happen in young kids and it can happen in the head and neck with some frequency. But you can appreciate that all of these look the same and, or not the same, but very similar. And you might think that they all have the same kind of differential diagnosis, but they all were very different. So it requires a histologic diagnosis looking at the cells under the microscope to understand really what's going on and get the full picture. And then this is my last case set, this, uh, some x-rays that we have here. And on the left, we've got this tooth with a crown, and then we've got a periapical radiolucency or a kind of dark spot at the roots of the teeth here. And we have a similar presentation on, in the other picture where this radiolucency or clearing in the x-ray might be pushing the teeth off to the side. And these ended up being two very different things. So on the left, which looks like many things that dentists see every day, ended up being a lymphoma. So the clinician, uh, when they extracted the tooth, they could have done an apicoectomy and submitted the tissue. Uh, they could have done a root canal to see what happens. This ended up being a lymphoma. And then this ended up being a, a run-of-the-mill inflammatory cyst. So again, because the tissue was submitted and uh, we were able to look at it under the microscope, these things ended up being completely different. So all of that to say that common things certainly are common and the kind of crazy cases that I showed are certainly not every day or even every year, but they're out there. And they are things that I have come across uh, and it's really important that that tissue was looked at under the microscope because they could have went undiagnosed. And that does happen a lot. Uh, in the dental profession, maybe not a lot, but way more than it should, where things are just thrown into the trash without establishing a definitive diagnosis. 
And the only way to do that, to establish a definitive diagnosis from that list of possibilities is by looking at it under the microscope. And that ends my, uh, my brief presentation to kind of give you a little background and all of the, the cool things that I see and, and nerd out on on a daily basis. Um, again, I post interesting cases and, and some quiz style content on my Instagram, and I post a lot of different things, including uh, differentials and their diagnosis and weird cases on my YouTube uh, once a week or every other week. And that's all I got. I'll open it up to questions. Awesome. Let, let me start this off right away. So a lot of us here on the call today have shadow dentists previously work for dentists. Some of us are dentists, for example, some are dental students to just kind of paint a really clear picture here, because we have people that um, are wondering how does a patient get in an oral pathologist chair? So do they see a dentist? Do they come straight to you? Are you getting biopsies behind the scene? And then you come in and see a patient when you get called on, what's the process is how someone gets in your chair to see you? That's a really great question. And that's going to be different for every oral pathologist. So I'll just share my experience working in a hospital setting, but it is a combination of everything you said. So we get biopsies from ENTs, from oral surgeons, from periodontists, from endodontists, from general dentists. Uh, that's where most of our biopsies come from. But as far as my clinical practice, I would say it's a pretty even split between different dental professionals. So dentists will refer to me. Uh, periodontists, oral surgeons, ENTs refer to me. Um, it's interesting, allergists refer to me every once in a while. Gastroenterologists have referred to me to rule out Crohn's disease, uh, rheumatologists to rule out Sjogren's syndrome. So we kind of are, we've got our hands in a lot of different piles here. It, it's, it's very interesting and it's very exciting because we focus on so many different things. Um, I'm putting a, a presentation together for a conference I'm going to where I worked on a case with infectious disease uh, and infectious disease had me consult. So we really get consults from everybody. If there's something weird in somebody's mouth and they don't know what it is, or they're having a hard time managing it, or they do know what it is and they don't want to manage it, then they end up in my, in my chair pretty much. Actually, right from there, this is actually a huge point. Um, you just mentioned Crohn's disease and two other, can we actually go into that? How do you detect if a patient has Crohn's disease? Because I, I've worked with patients in the hospital doing anesthesia and whatnot, people have Crohn's disease. From your standpoint, this is huge, right? Because now we're actually teaching over this call what to notice in the oral cavity, if you, if you could take it up from right there. Yeah, so uh, there are some non-specific things that help to contribute to Crohn's. And there are some specific things where we're like, this is Crohn's. The non-specific things are a lip swelling, similar to orofacial granulomatosis, where they get really, really fat lips. That can be seen in Crohn's disease. Um, aphthous ulcers or canker sores. If patients have several aphthous ulcers or canker sores, that can be indicative of a systemic process. So folic acid deficiency, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, a wide variety of even HIV. If patients have a very large and um, non-resolving major apathy, it can be a sign of HIV. A little bit more specifically, if they get these kind of linear snail track fissures in the vestibule, um, between their gums and their cheek. That's relatively specific. And then under the, and under the microscope on biopsy, if we see granulomas, which are a very, very specific type of inflammation that is also seen in the intestines of Crohn's patients, then it, it's Crohn's. And we've had quite a few patients where the only manifestation of their Crohn's was intraorally. Uh, and eventually they develop other areas of their gastrointestinal system, but working with gastroenterologists to help them understand like, no, this patient has exclusively oral Crohn's. They need to be on something like Humira, which is used to treat a Crohn's, uh, can be a little bit challenging. It's like trying to convince them. But if you, if you Google Crohn's and you see these kind of weird looking lines inside the vestibule that are ulcerated, that's pretty specific for Crohn's. What, what age? Staying on this Crohn's, what age, what, um, what, if it's just oral, what, what age do you see this come out? Um, oh, I had another thing in my, maybe some similar symptoms. <laughs> it was like age, 
um, or, or there, is there a uh, sex predilection? Um, those kind of things. For oral Crohn's, I'm not sure about the sex predilection. I don't, I don't have that stat right in front of me, but I do know that age, most of the patients anecdotally have been younger, um, teens and twenties, but that's not to say that we've had adults. We've had adults come in too, or we've had to work it up. Uh, we in oral pathology get to lot, ask a lot of really uncomfortable questions, uh, including what is, what are your daily bowel movements like if we're worried about Crohn's? Um, so that, that does come up. And, and again, some patients do have gastrointestinal discomfort, they've got diarrhea, they've got a lot of the other symptoms, and some don't. Um, so, you know, we might be the first line of defense. And then typically after that, they get a colonoscopy or endoscopy, where either more lesions are found, or they're not, and the patient has Crohn's exclusively to the oral cavity. The, con the confirmation is the biopsy, the granulomas under the microscope confirms that the, the suspicions were actually Crohn's if they've got the other kind of things going on. non caseating frames, right? Yes, yeah. exactly. Guys, hop in with, uh, with questions. So one of the questions we had was, why did you pick oral pathology over other specialties? Yeah, so uh, if there are any pre-dents on the call, I want to start with the caveat that dentistry is a great profession uh, and the world needs good and ethical dentists. Um, I found in the middle, beginning to middle of my second year of dental school, my D2 year, that I was absolutely miserable. Uh, and I thought about dropping out of dental school and taking the MCAT and going to medical school because dentistry wasn't what I wanted it to be. I wanted it to be more diagnostic. I wanted it to be more disease processes. I wanted it to be more of the kind of house, if anyone's, if, if I'm dating myself with the TV show House. Uh, where you're kind of working on a puzzle with a patient. And I found that it was a lot more artistic where you have to worry about line angles and you have to worry about, you know, half like fragments of a millimeter of depth. And that was just not for me. I was not having it. It's, I didn't enjoy it. I didn't want to do it for the rest of my life. And I had a crisis uh, and Interestingly enough, at Ohio State, there's a lot of student groups and the Association of Women Dentists came to my rescue because they had a lecture series where all of the program directors from all of the specialty programs came and gave a talk about what their specialty was. And my thought at the time was, you know what, if I don't find something in this lecture that I like or that speaks to me, I'm out of here. And I was like getting ready to take MCAT prep courses. Uh, and was introduced to oral pathology even before I had an oral pathology course, started shadowing and, and fell in love. So I knew from D2 year that I was, I was going to be an oral pathologist. Well, hopping off of that, what were the steps that you had to take to get to where you are today? You know, well, you mentioned that oral pathologists are, there's like a much smaller population of you guys. So how did you even find your mentor? How did you get to shadow other oral pathologists to even get into residency, et cetera? Yeah, so uh, most dental schools do have an oral pathologist. And if they don't, then hopefully a dental school nearby has an oral pathologist. And most, if not all oral pathologists I know love when people love oral pathology. We geek out on just crazy stuff that we've seen and what's come across our desk recently. We just love to talk shop. And so if anyone shows even a remote amount of interest, we are going to take them under our wing and we are going to make sure that they are cared for and that they find their way. So I, uh, I found my mentor at Ohio State and I shadowed her weekly in her clinical practice. I sat with her at the microscope a little bit. I did an IDEA fellowship in teaching oral pathology with her. And that's what's so, in my opinion, really important now that I'm kind of on the other side working at a residency program, that if you're interested in oral pathology, the best thing you can do on an application or moving forward is to have an oral pathology mentor that will vouch for you. Because the profession is so small, if someone is applying to an oral pathology residency program from a dental school, we will call that oral pathologist because we know them. They, they are our friends, they're our colleagues and say, hey, so-and-so from your institution is applying to oral pathology, tell me about them. And it's 
actually probably one of the most weighted things other than, you know, grades and how you did in an oral pathology course. Um, there are people that go into panic mode D4, they don't like dentistry, they didn't get into another specialty like ortho or surgery, and so they might want to do oral pathology as kind of an out, uh, and we kind of pick up on that pretty quickly because the oral pathologists at their institution will say, I've never heard of this person before in my life. Uh, so getting involved early, shadowing early, uh, and having mentorship, which is very easy in oral pathology. If you know an oral pathologist, you have a mentor. Because uh, again, we will adopt you and we will make sure that that you're around to see all the cool stuff that, or at least we think it's cool. So on that note, of like the cool things you've seen, can you share a bit about like the cool experiences and like the most memorable um, like memory you have? I, I have so many memorable things. I, I, so that was one of like my inspirations for creating the YouTube that I did is just sharing all of the crazy stuff that I've seen. My first month of residency, there was a 25 year old girl walking off a plane at JFK and she broke her leg walking off the plane at JFK, came to the hospital and got x-rays. They opened her mouth and she had a huge tumor, huge tumor. And uh, they did x-rays and she had holes in her spine, in her pelvis, in her ribs. Uh, so Dr. Gallagher, do you, know, do you know what this young girl had? Maybe multiple, multiple myeloma. This 25 year old girl had multiple myeloma. That's wild. That's unheard of. 25 year old women don't get multiple myeloma. That's a disease of 50 year old men. And the way that this was discovered is she was walking off a plane at JFK and broke her leg. Um, it, it's kind of wild. I had uh, a patient with histoplasmosis where I was like, this is cancer. And I, I told the patient, like, be ready for a cancer diagnosis. And it ended up being this weird fungal infection that we don't see in New York. We actually see it more often in Ohio, where I'm from. Um, the presentation I'm putting together for a conference was a patient with tuberculosis that I met in the COVID ward. Like, imagine if I, I wasn't wearing an N95 and I met a, a TB patient and I had been exposed to tuberculosis. Um, I, I, my boss, I was with my boss seeing a patient. He pulled something out of a patient's palate and we didn't know what it was. So we went to Reddit. And we went to the subreddit, what is this thing? And somebody found an answer for us. So it's like every day something crazy or cool is going on. Uh, and if, if you nerd out on that kind of stuff, I, I hate to do like the self-promotion and plugging, but that was like one of my motivations behind this YouTube channel is just sharing all of just the crazy stuff that I come across. I feel like just hopefully other people feel that I'm a nicer house. Like it's all about just solving puzzles and and figuring out what crazy stuff people have. <laughs> you know, you know when did anyone here on the call play Pokemon when they were younger? Like when you went right when you like walked through the grass and everything, and you were like waiting for the next guy to pop out. I feel like when you send out a biopsy, or like you find this weird lesion in the mouth, and you send it out, you're and you're waiting on it to come back. You think you know what it is, right? You think it's you're hoping for it to be like Pikachu, but it's gonna be like a caterpillar. You know, like. <laughs> that's what, what i what i feel like oral pathology i love it that's i love that i love the that's game, actually, yeah. Dago, dingo that was those that, that was a great class you yeah. actually you actually taught at that class that yeah. lecture yeah in my residency i did that's right that's right that was a good one yeah All right no, and, and it's oh, like sorry. uh i had a, a one of the oral surgery residents come up to me and, and hand me a biopsy he goes this is a mealoblastoma and i'm like oh is it now it's an amyloblastoma okay we'll see Okay, see. So, you know, it's like you don't know until you know, but it, it, was, a, it was a good case. Um, I have two questions, if that's good. Yeah. So, um, first of all, thank you again for joining us today. Um, so, I'm a first year dental student and I'm in biochemistry, right? In those first year courses. Um, and I'm sitting here memorizing dozens and dozens of rare genetic diseases, and it's hard to keep them all straight. Um, for you in your day-to-day, -day, you're doing less clinical work and more of this kind of an understanding of the, the pathologies and the genetic and all these things. And how do you, how do you, A, keep it all straight? B, how do you kind of stay up to date with the latest findings? Because you're kind of straddled between dentistry as well as medicine. Um, and then third, kind of a, you know, like how much of your job involves genetic screening? Yeah, that's, that's a, a great question. So it is kind of the crossroads of, of dentistry and medicine. Um, as far as learning all that we need to know, uh, residency was a very interesting experience because you almost feel like 
your four years of dental school where you learned materials and you learned, you know, the, the margins of different crown types and you learned about depth of, of the gingival floor out the window. And you essentially start from scratch. So I remember joking uh, with a, a former teacher of mine. I never thought I was going to need to look at a microscope ever again after seventh grade biology. And I look at a microscope every day of my life. Um, and it, it really is kind of relearning, starting from scratch. I mean, you get a little bit of a base in dental school, and I got even more so doing all the shadowing I did. But a lot of it is starting from stage zero. And that's why oral pathology residency is three years, because you really, uh, and even then, that's why it's called a practice, right? We're always learning, we're always growing. Uh, every day is a, a learning experience. My, my 71 year old boss that I, I share an office with, who was on one of the, uh, he was on the original paper that, that discovered medication related osteonecrosis of the jaws. He's a giant in the field and every day he's learning something new. So he's always reading the literature and, and you know, he's kind of this giant in the field. Um, for the genetic question, that it really, again, it's rare until it's in your chair. And another story, I went to a conference pre-COVID and I came back with my co-resident who was on rotation. I was the only resident on service because my co-resident was off on rotation and my chief had just had a baby. And I was like, I just really am dreading clinic. I'm so tired from the flight. First patient sits in the chair and is like, I don't like the pigmentation on my tongue. And I was like, oh, okay. So I do my intraoral exam and I'm like, why is your jaw swollen here? And she's like, oh yeah, you know, I... I had like the shaving when I was younger, when I was 10 years old, I have this bone condition. I've broken my leg a few times. It's like, oh, what's the bone condition? Oh, fibrous dysplasia. I've got it in my leg, my arm, and I had it in my mouth. So fibrous dysplasia, hyperpigmentation. So the next question was the awkward, when was your first period? Six years old, McCune Albright, my first patient of the day after uh, flying to a conference and coming home. And for those of you not familiar, McCune Albright is a rare syndrome that is defined by hyperpigmentation, cafe au lait spots on the skin, by, uh, polyostatic or multiple bone fibrous dysplasia, and um, endocrine abnormalities, most commonly precocious or early puberty. So that was one of those where I was expecting it to just like just be a day and to see nothing exciting. And I was tired from a long flight. And first thing is this really random rare syndrome that I ended up publishing. And so we have to be familiar. And a lot of, of the time that we spend is on genetic abnormalities. And that was a patient that we referred to uh, medical genetics to, for a workup. Brandon, really important. McCune Albright, that comes up on almost every CBC exam. You need to know that it's all over this book. You need to know that, okay? That's that's in like their, their like 200 ultimate questions. McCune Albright, right there for you. Perfect. And I'll make you I'll make you a case video one of these days. I try Thank to you. mix it up every so often. And speaking of like residency and these crazy cases, like how does residency prepare you for these types of cases? Like I I can't even imagine. Like like <laughs> how? Yeah, uh, and. You know, it, it's nothing. It's not going to prepare you because every once in a while you get a once in, in ten years or once in a career diagnosis, and there's really no way to prepare other than study. So a large portion of residency is spent reading, looking at at old slides. So in our resident room, uh, there are just bookshelves of exchange slides where different residency programs all over the country will send interesting slides every you know, six months or so, and we kind of trade these interesting cases. And what that does is it selects out all of the weird stuff that other people are seeing, so you get to have that experience too. And it, it creates this kind of community effect, like, oh, UNC sent us the study set, we'll see what they sent us. And it's, it's very exciting, because it's, it's everybody's really interesting cases. So it's kind of that selection bias where, you know, I'm showing you the really kind of rare, cool stuff, um, but that's how you learn is from other people's experiences, seeing other people's cases and kind of increasing your exposure and reading a lot of, a lot of reading and online resources and, and things like that. 
So how would you say you break down a typical diagnosis for patients? Yeah, that's, that's a really great question. So it's easy for me to sit on a call and just rattle off all of this mumbo jumbo. Um, that is really where I think we come in. That's a really important part of our job is translating. Um, and even in dentistry, that's really important. You have to be able to meet a patient where they are. And so if you're throwing out, well, you know, you've got mild epithelial dysplasia, which has a malignant transformation rate of da 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 in 10 years, we're going to have to do an incisional biopsy every da 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 you know, their eyes are going to glaze over. And so having kind of a scripted way to approach a patient over everything, you've got class two caries that we're going to do an amalgam restoration on using a Toffelmeyer band, like they're not going to know what that is. They don't have your knowledge, but saying you've got a cavity in between your teeth that we got to get rid of, and we're going to fill it with a silver filling. And you might have a little discomfort in between your teeth because of the tools that we're using. And that's normal. So by kind of putting it into more layman's terms, you're able to get understanding. That's even more important when someone has an autoimmune disease, a chronic disease that they're going to have forever, a you know, life-changing diagnosis. I am fortunate, I'm sorry, Brendan, but you're going to be making cancer diagnoses. I'm, I'm fortunate in that most cancer diagnoses get kind of made in the community, and I'm just seeing it under the microscope. But telling someone they have cancer um, is obviously a, a life-changing thing for them. And I, I, it, it's difficult for the provider as well. Uh, it's, it's something where, you know, you, you know what you're about to tell somebody is going to change their life forever in a, a very challenging and difficult way. Um, and, and rehearsing, having practice doing that, and checking for understanding is really important. So I, I do do the talk back method a lot with my patients where I say, you know, I know I just threw a lot at you. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what you understood from what I said? And so if they missed key points, I can go back and explain, that's really great. Here's a few additional things that I want to emphasize. And the talk back method is great with anything, general dentistry, perio, but especially pathology when, you know, it's important that they're taking certain medications or they're following through with certain actions. All right. Speaking so that, oh, just really quick on, on that topic, Dr. World, how do we, I, you, us, how do we like, like really get in, How do we tell a patient that they have cancer? Yeah. Um, so different people are going to have different, um, different responses for that question. Uh, my personal strategy is if I'm concerned about a malignancy, a cancer, before doing a biopsy, I tell them up front, just so you know, I'm very concerned that this might be cancer. I'm not going to know for sure until I look under the microscope, but I want you to be prepared for that diagnosis. And what that does is that takes that shock away from when they get the diagnosis. So they go through the initial stages of grief before they have the diagnosis. I haven't told them they have cancer yet. I said, I'm worried about cancer. I can't tell you until I look at it under the microscope, but in their brain, they're already starting processing. Whereas if I say, you know, you have this lesion and we got to look at it under the microscope and then it turns out to be cancer, they they're not going through the same sort of denial and shock that they would from an initial thing. They're kind of already expecting it. So if I'm wrong, which happened in the case of the tuberculosis case that I'm presenting and the histoplasmosis case, because those are on the differential diagnosis for cancer, um, you know, it's a, it's a relief. Like, oh, great, I don't have cancer. But if I'm right, then they're ready to act on it. So my suspicion was right. You have cancer. The next step is you're going to be referred to this surgeon we already set up an appointment for you, which is also helpful if you have a good relationship with a head and neck surgeon. Uh, you call them and say, I'm about to deliver this diagnosis. When can you see them? So that way they have a plan of action. So, um, you know, they're prepared for the diagnosis. They get the diagnosis and they're ready to act on it. Oh, now, wow. what do you do if, if it's a surprise? Um, you know, again, it's helpful. The patient's going to be in shock but it's helpful that you make yourself available to them. You can, you can call my office at any time. 
Uh, and then you also have that plan of action. You know, the next step is this. You're going to see this person. This is the scheduled date and time that we have for you. I like that a lot. That's very helpful. Yeah. JD, you were going to. Yeah, we were just going to say that there was a question in the group or in the in the chat, if you hadn't noticed. Um, someone asked, how would you recommend practicing dentists to keep up with oral path pathology and stay fresh in diagnosing pathology that might not be as common? Yeah, and, and this goes with pretty much anything in, in dentistry and goes back to that idea of lifelong learning, uh, and that's CE. So continuing education is important and required, and different states require different amounts, but you will be able to find oral pathology CE. I promise you that. Oral pathologists are constantly out in the community looking for opportunities to speak uh, because Number one, it's something that we get excited about. We love nerding out in front of people and trying to convince you that what we do is cool and what we see is cool. And then also because it's great for us to be known. Uh, you know, you, you should have an oral pathologist in your back pocket, just like you would a periodontist, an endodontist and an oral surgeon. You wanna be able to make an appropriate referral. So uh, the best thing a general dentist can do is recognize what's normal. And if something is not normal, you refer it. You refer it to a periodontist, an endodontist, a oral surgeon, or a, an oral pathologist. And that's really all that, that you need to do. The front line is dental hygiene and general dentistry. That's who's picking it up. You do not have to be the one to give a diagnosis. That's why I spent three years of my life in a residency program learning how to do that. But you do want to make sure that you make an appropriate referral when it's time. A good rule of thumb is two weeks. So uh, this is what I teach my students and people that rotate through. If something looks weird, have the patient come back in two weeks. And if it still looks weird, even if it looks a little bit better, refer, period. A lot of times dentists will fall into this trap of, you know, it's two weeks later and it looks a little bit better. Let's wait another two weeks. Patient comes back you know, maybe it is about the same. Maybe it's a little bit better. I don't know. Let's wait another two weeks. And then three months later, the patient has a fungating tumor and it wasn't an early diagnosis. So good rule of thumb is two weeks. And if it's not completely gone, you refer it. And then what about the process of a biopsy? Can you just go over like, is there ever a time maybe you see something and don't biopsy? Or maybe there's a time like, you see something, maybe it could be this, but biopsy it anyway. Is there anything, uh, are there any risks to the patient on taking a biopsy and just sending it out just to see? Are there any, is there any liability to the practice for taking a biopsy? Like, is it going to cost money? That is it going to be reversed? Is it worth it? You know, you know, just like the overall. Yeah, absolutely. So the um, one thing that's really important to me is ethical practice and uh, money should not motivate anybody, but biopsies are billable codes. So you, you can bill for biopsies. On the more uh, patient care side, which is the side that I, I hope motivates people to, to do biopsies and histologic and tissue um, submission, is the, uh, there are risks and benefits with any procedure, but as long as you discuss risks and benefits, just like you would an extraction or a root canal or a filling or any procedure that you do, then you're covered. Um, you know, there are risks of bleeding, risks of infection, risks of clots. Uh, there's always going to be risks. The other side of that is that biopsies are in and of itself risk mitigation, where you have a periapical radiolucency and you don't know what it is. If it's a carious teeth and it's a carious tooth and it's bombed out, you've got huge caries, non-restorable, it's got a huge periapical radiolucency. You take the tooth out and you get rid of the granulation tissue. Is that granulation tissue or is it lymphoma? The only way to know is to submit it. 99.99%, it's a bombed out tooth. It is probably inflammatory granulation tissue, probably. If you throw it out, you'll never know and you run the risk of not knowing. And it's not much of a gamble, right? 99% probably, it's, it's bombed out tooth, gonna be related to the bombed out tooth. Uh, if you follow the patient and there's still a radiolucency, then you got to act on it. But that's a situation where, you know, maybe you don't submit the tissue because you're willing to incur that very small risk of not having an answer. If 
you don't want any risk whatsoever and you want to completely eliminate your risk in that situation, you submit the tissue and we're happy to take it. Uh, situations that don't necessarily need biopsied are things that can be clinically diagnosed. So linea alba, leukoedema, uh, geographic tongue are things that I don't typically biopsy. But you know, fibroma, we hear all the time of people taking off fibromas and saying, ah, oh, it's just a fibroma, no big deal. But my case that I showed you, there was something that if I saw it, it, I would have said this is a fibroma and it was rhabdomyosarcoma and that patient's getting chemotherapy. So it, it's kind of a, how much risk are you willing to incur that determines whether or not you submit tissue? There are circumstances that you should always submit tissue. If you are excising something like that fibroma, like that mucosal, that you have to submit. That should not go in the garbage. Um, but if it's something like a periapical radiolucency, that's kind of on your practice philosophy. You're probably safe if it's a bombed out tooth to get rid of that tissue, but the only way to be sure is to submit it. Yeah, and speaking of that, like there's so many steps to making really a proper diagnosis, making sure you cover all the bases. How long does it take you to diagnose a patient? And I guess like in a day, like how many diagnoses do you make? Yeah, so uh, from a biopsy standpoint, and also to address the cost of biopsy, biopsy equipment should be free um, as far as formalin bottles and lab sheets and mailers. Uh, most, if not all, oral pathologists will provide that for you. I know my practice does, and most practices I know do. Um, as far as turnaround time, for most specimen that we get in the mail, and we, we do get them in the mail, uh, it's 24 hours. So the specimen arrives, we open it up, we take it out, we do what's called a gross examination where we measure it, we describe it, we submit it, and then the next day it's on a slide, we diagnose it, and then the submitting doctor gets a report right away. It obviously takes some time because it goes through the mail uh, and the mail takes time, but from the moment it walks in our door, it's 24 hours. The only exceptions are if it's bone, we have to put the bone in acid so that it's soft enough for us to cut and put on a slide or if it's something crazy. If it's something where we have to do a workup to try to figure out what cells are in it, then it takes a little bit longer. Like that rhabdomyosarcoma case, we have to prove it. We have to prove that that is actually that type of cancer because it could be a lot of different types of cancer. So that takes a little bit more time. But the turnaround time is, is very quick. Now, as far as patients, uh, usually I can have a differential diagnosis for them when they're in the chair. This is what I think it is. This is the next steps. This is the treatment, or I'm, I want to biopsy to know for sure what's going on. What are the what are some of the instruments that you use? Just a quick question. It's actually leading up to another question I have for you. Some of the I know of the 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 hole punch biopsy thing. What are some of the other things that you use that are specific for biopsies? So the the most common piece of equipment that I use in my practice is a mirror and a piece of gauze. Uh, that's what I use for probably 80 to 90% of my patients. Uh, I do do biopsies, but not that commonly. Um, I, I do punch occasionally, but because a lot of my biopsies are on movable mucosa, like the tongue or the cheeks or the lips, I do a retraction suture technique where I use a silk suture, I put it through the lesion, and then I'm able to pull the tissue so that I can kind of isolate the tissue away from normal. And once I've got it pulled away, it's much easier for me to cut either with a 15 blade or with scissors. I can take that retracted tissue and just kind of lop it off. Uh, and it's also helpful because it can keep that tissue flat when I put it in the formalin bottle, it prevents it from curling up on itself. And then to close, uh, if it's a, a very large defect, I will use uh, usually chromic resorbable suture. Um, or silver nitrate. So if it's very small, if I'm looking for hemostasis to get the patient to stop bleeding, I'll do cautery with silver nitrate. I do that most frequently because I'm doing really, really small biopsies typically. I actually have, because on the previous slide, you had showed that I think it was like a first molar and interradicularly there was the radiolucency and it turned out to be lymphoma. Um, would there be a way to create a device kind of like the hole punch, but to make it easier, quicker, less harmful to the patient, and also more accessible for the dentist to do that without actually affecting the tooth, 
a, you know, like a ballpoint pen where you have like the click and the pen comes out and then you click it and the pen, it disappears back into the pen. I had an idea. This, this is like off topic, but I thought it'd be pretty cool. I was looking for someone to tell me if it's actually feasible to make like a ballpoint pen hole punch biopsy thing where the formalin's actually inside the ballpoint pen. And maybe you could make it where it, it sticks out pretty far and you could punch through the mucosa into like interradicularly between that tooth, for example, to get to the lymphoma area and then just retract it. It goes into the pen, into the form. You could send it out inside that. Is that feasible? Is it? So a, a few thoughts on, on that. First, there are retractable punches rather than the ones that are already pre-made. I use the pre-made ones. The issue with the retractable punches is that some of them are poorly made. And there was an issue where the punch would actually get stuck in the patient. And then it kind of doesn't work as a biopsy tool anymore. Uh, and then also, I, I mean, if it's a punch and it's not retractable, then you're good to go. But there were some retractable punches I know where it kind of broke and then it wouldn't retract with the tissue. Uh, there are trephines where you can actually just go directly through the tissue into the bone. That's a little bit different. And then as far as formalin, that's a really important point. So if you're doing a biopsy, formalin should be as far away from the patient as possible. I keep formalin on a separate table when I do a biopsy. I will take the tissue, I'll put it on my surgical drape, cut it with scissors, and then drop it in the formalin and change my gloves. The reason is formalin can burn patients severely, really, really bad burn. So you don't want to put your instruments in it. You don't want to get, you don't want to spill it. I, I keep it away from my instruments. I keep it away from everything because I'm super paranoid. I don't want to do anything to cause a chemical burn in the patient. So I, I keep formalin as far away as possible. But if you want to make a trephine, retractable trephine into bone, you know, I, I'll give you some seed money for that. That, if, that if, doesn't get stuck. And it doesn't and, get stuck. And protects it in form yeah. without it exposing to the patient. Something Absolutely. like that. Well, yeah, you got to be, you got to be careful with that. I just, I'm not going to volunteer for you to, to try it out on me though. Of course not. Do biopsies have to be a certain size? Can they be anything, you know what I mean? To fit under a slide, I was thinking. Uh, so the largest biopsy that we can put on a slide uh, at our institution is 2.5 centimeters by 2.5 centimeters. But that being said, part of the grossing process is submitting representative samples. So we actually cut it so it fits. Uh, and we'll look at certain aspects of a tumor. You know, we might get a huge resection where we're looking at what's the distance of this tumor, this cancer from the margin, and we're submitting a, a kind of a piece that gives us that idea. Right, right. Um, as far as how big of a biopsy, uh, that depends on the clinical scenario. So as big enough for you to give us tissue that's diagnostic is the answer to that question. Another thing to remember too, if you're biopsying, excuse me, if you're biopsying an ulcer, uh, you have to get tissue around the ulcer. If you biopsy just the ulcer, you're going to get nothing. We're, we're going to tell you it's an ulcer. So you have to kind of get adjacent tissue as well to get a diagnosis. That was real in the weeds. All right. So given all the diagnoses that you've given in your career, um, then the last one of the last questions we're, that we're going to ask you is, have you ever diagnosed something that could have prevented a major illness? If so, how did the patient feel knowing that you caught an early diagnosis? Um, I have a few experiences with that, and I've had a few experiences with the reverse. So um, I've had a few experiences where biopsies of uh, dentitor cysts, which are very common, they are with impacted, mol typically third molars, we'll see them. And someone that isn't familiar with oral pathology was sent the tissue and was diagnosed as an adonogenic myxoma. Um, those are very similar under the microscope. And there are very subtle differences that only people with a lot of oral pathology training really understand. So the patient was referred this, this I believe the patient was 10, 11, or 12, was referred to our institution for a large mandibular resection for their adonogenic myxoma. We got the slide because typically what institutional policy is before surgery is done at your hospital, you have to look at the slide. And when we looked at the slide, it was a dentator assist, which the treatment is nothing. The treatment is curatage, just take it out. Uh, myxoma is, an ex is a resection with one or two, depending on the surgeon, centimeter margins. So this 10-year-old kid was about to lose 
a fourth of his jaw. And then because of our diagnosis, we saved him from that extensive surgery. So that was a big deal. Um, another, other than cancer, which is kind of the low hanging fruit where we caught cancer early, which does happen. We can catch superficially invasive squamous cell carcinoma where the biopsy itself was curative. Another kind of just to steer away from cancer is vesicular erosive autoimmune diseases. So patients might have like a little ulcer on their gingiva where if caught early by us could have prevented systemic issues. Uh, I have seen patients with pemphigus vulgaris that end up in the emergency room and admitted because they can't eat or they can't drink. So they've lost 40 pounds of weight. They're hooked up to an IV uh, and, and they have to get nourished because they're dehydrated. I, I've had one or two patients where they were just starting to get it and we were able to catch it early and get them treated early. And those conditions, it's really important to treat early because the earlier you catch it, the easier the treatment process will be. The later you catch it, the more recalcitrant or the more um, resistant that disease is to treatment. So that's, that's something where maybe the patient didn't recognize it the same as a patient that got an early cancer diagnosis, but for us makes us feel good. All right, so the final question that we have lined up for you is, have you ever been able to, or have you ever not been able to diagnose somebody and what did you do in that situation? Yeah, so the, um, there's, there's gray area in everything in life, right? In dentistry, some will say it's incipient caries, some will say that it's true caries. The same is true for pathology. So there are certain cases that fall in a gray zone and either you don't, want to call it without backup. So we do that sometimes we're like, we're pretty sure that this is a glandular donogenic cyst, but we want to get somebody else's opinion on it. And that way we have backup. That's one scenario. And the other is, you know what? We've done 15 different tests on this tissue and we still have no clue what this is. So what we do is we'll send it to an academic expert so there's like five people in the country that have specific areas of expertise that we know well, uh, and that when we are just totally stumped, we send it to them. And they have specific advanced tests that they can do. They can do these really absurd genetic panels that only they have access to because they're the ones that published on it and that we just don't have access to it. So, you know, we're not above our pride. We're willing to admit like, you know what, we need help we're going to send this to an expert and, and we do send it every blue moon, maybe two or three times a year, we get this just absurd case that we just, all of our tests are coming up negative. We don't have any of the tests in our system, even though I, I'm part of a big hospital system. So we send it to an expert that has all of these tests that are readily available and easy for them to do. And they have a lot more experience doing. All right. Thank you, Dr. Roth, for all your insight. And thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight. Um, this is the Students Dentistry and Law team. And we'll stick around a little bit more if you have any more questions. But so far, that's all we have. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much for just teaching us so much about your career, um, something that is I didn't know much about until now. So thank you so much. Um, we really great, like, greatly appreciate everything that you've told us today. So yeah. Thanks for joining us tonight. Yeah, thanks for having me. Good luck to everybody on your journey.